Welcome to another edition of uh, Chicago Crossing Model Railroad at the Bench. Eric here with you. And uh, today uh, we are in part two of the uh, Cassidy Tire Warehouse Rebuild. And I figure there's a lot of different uh, topics in which to cover going forward. So what I'm going to do here is just kind of split things up into um, one video uh, per topic or one topic per video, simply because it makes it easier than attempting to, you know, cover disparate things like uh, concrete block uh, preparation, window glazing uh, treatments like these air conditioners, uh, you know, modifications uh, like this, you know, corrugated siding here. So I figure it's probably going to be a little bit easier uh, for us to uh, just kind of dive into uh, one topic and uh, one topic uh, only, and it'll also, you know, just keep you from having to uh, stare at this building for half hour intervals on end. Anyway, with that in mind, uh, let's talk about uh, windows and let's talk about replacing uh, window panels. So what I have uh, set up here are some examples of the uh, window uh, inserts that came with uh, this kit. Again, this uh, Uniroyal Tires Cassidy Warehouse is actually the American Hardware Supply Walther's kit. And, you know, these kits are all, probably almost as, as old as I am. You know, they were always well, uh, finely molded kits, but, you know, I was 12 years old and I remember seeing these in the hobby shop. So these have been around a while. And so what that means is, uh, even though they're uh, high quality moldings, they're still plastic kits. They still have certain things that are obviously never going to be to scale. And one of those is the windows themselves. If you think about this, you know, this particular window insert here is basically going to be uh, about as thick as a human head. <laughs> if you think about the size of your average end scale figurine. And of course, that's not to scale. But it makes it uh, such that, you know, circa 1990 or 91 or 92 or whenever this kit came out, um, that this plastic could be easily handled. You know, once again, you look at the thickness of the part, and that's pretty typical for, you know, a, a model coming off of an injection molded sprue. Nowadays, there are uh, a lot of more refined uh, industrial kits. You can, you know, get stuff through like ITLA models and, uh, I think through uh, N-Scale Architect, you can buy like a big curtain wall uh, industrial background building. And a lot of those come with more uh, refined uh, pieces than these, you know, really thick plastics. But the reason I bring that up is because um, the considerations as to how to model, um, you know, replacement window panels, like if a window pane breaks, uh, you know, and they take that pane out and replace it with a fiberglass insert or something like that, it actually really matters in terms of the methodology that you use. So first we'll talk about the contrast situation, which is um, this particular uh, type of kit. So this, uh, this is, again, it is another Walther's kit, probably maybe as old as, as uh, uh, the American Hardware Supply. Not sure when this one originally came out. Uh, in any case, uh, what you notice is that um, the windows here don't have the same thickness between, uh, you know, the supports for the window uh, glass versus the glass itself. And in this case, it was actually very, very straightforward for me to uh, simply paint in, um, you know, the replacement panes. And I even did this after already markering in, uh, you know, these uh, supports over and borders uh, over here. So that's case number one, but that is not uh, this building here. This building is case number two. So given that we're dealing with thick window panes, of course, the question is, can we use the, the same technique easily in order to uh, fill in uh, the, you know, replacement panes? And so I took a, a piece off of here, a number of windows obviously down here no longer exist. So these are basically uh, the spare windows. And so I figured I could use these as a, a way to kind of show an example of how painting works in this case. So what I used here is I used a, a couple of different paints. You know, what I've set up here is kind of my color palette for uh, replacement window panes. 
And what I've got are all Vallejo paints, uh, ivory, deck tan, yellow ochre, green brown, refractive green, and green gray. And really, you know, you can use uh, whatever kind of color you want. These are basically just the, the colors that I imagine uh, these fiberglass inserts coming into or that they just get dirty or stained over time. So in any case, uh, if we focus back in on uh, what happens when you paint the window frame, here I'm basically using uh, a Flexifile uh, Zero brush. You know, it's a nice thin pinpoint brush. And so when you look at it head on, you can say to yourself, well, pretty good. You can see panel inserts. If you come in a little bit closer, what you start to notice though, is that there's a lot of slop uh, in the system and you may not necessarily be able to see that, but you certainly might take your take my word for it that you can see um, the paint is uneven. In other words, if you look at these corners here, despite my best efforts, I now have a situation where I'm gonna have to try to touch that up in order to keep these window frames looking nice and neat. From head on, doesn't look terrible. From here, ugh, doesn't look good at all. The other thing to think about is if you're gonna light up this building, what do you want these to look like? Um, Typically, these, these panes are translucent. Uh, they are, again, usually just fiberglass sheet. And so that means you will see through them. But if you hold this up to the light, uh, what you notice is you can tell that different thicknesses of paint exist all throughout that uh, window pane. And that's really not an optimal situation. So for me, you know, I looked at, at, at this as a, a practice approach and I really was dissatisfied with the result, even though kind of from far away, it looks okay. It's not gonna look all that great with lighting uh, inside of the building. And on top of that, it just doesn't meet my personal standard for neatness that I like to uh, have on my model railroad. So uh, your mileage may vary. Certainly you can use a smaller brush. Certainly, you know, I could spend the time touching this up, but I really didn't wanna spend a whole bunch of time doing that. So what is the other approach? And that is simply to take advantage of the fact that given this stuff is already, you know, thick window painting, if I turn this back, now I've got the perfect template to basically just be able to cut out extremely thin polystyrene and place it wherever I want uh, replacement window panes. And that's actually really, really helpful. So what I was able to do is to find uh, that, uh, you know, 0.01 by 0.08 uh, Thou uh, strip styrene, this is all evergreen stuff, was actually kind of the perfect um, width in order to be able to fit uh, into one window pane and one window pane only. And at that point, uh, what I did with this stuff is I basically sponge painted strips of uh, this polystyrene different colors. Uh, from any of this uh, palette over here. And then I basically, you know, took, uh, took these windows and I glued all that uh, into place wherever I wanted them. So I cut them using uh, my chopper back here in order to try to get as straight of a cut as possible. Again, you can take something like a square ruler like this and make a jig so that it's not going to shift one way or another. And so what you get instead is, is you know, nice uh, clarified boundaries. And uh, then using canopy glue, I glued them into uh, place randomly throughout uh, the window. So that's good, uh, that's a good start. Obviously what that means is, of course, is that you're going to get a 0.01 uh, inch gap between uh, the window glass now and the window frame itself. So to ameliorate that situation, because what I don't wanna be doing is um, you know, taking the window backing and gluing it just to those uh, few, you know, squares of, of window patching, is I basically took a combination of other uh, polystyrene strips that were uh, 0.01 in width, uh, for instance, you know, the 0.156, and then in between windows, uh, the 0.188. And I used those in order to uh, essentially create um, a kind of structure for uh, the window glass to adhere to. And at that point, uh, you've got four sides of contact for those window panes or for those window glasses. 
so that you can make sure that this stuff actually holds up and isn't being held on just by glue on a few different points. And it also just increases uh, the neatness of the entire thing. So that way the windows hold together nicely. Now, likewise, I mentioned uh, before about clear polystyrene. And a lot of these uh, window uh, coverings are actually, you know, maybe a little bit more uh, transparent than translucent. And so here's an example where, you know, the evergreen uh, polystyrene uh, sheet colors are really, really useful. I find that green is very, very common for these buildings. And so basically, you know, I end up cutting down uh, pieces of this green polystyrene to exactly the same uh, size and gluing that into uh, these window frames. At that point, what you, uh, what you get is you get a really nice and very, very neat looking uh, set of industrial windows where the sponge painted uh, panes that are this 0.01 thickness, they actually do show a translucent quality to them tinted by that color. Um, the use of, of sponge painting as a technique leaves a little bit of modeling to it, but at the same time makes it consistent. So it actually does look like, you know, slightly dirty uh, uh, fiberglass paneling. When you take that together, you basically get a much neater approach. Um, what I've noticed looking at this building head on and at angles is I can't really tell that there's that 0.01 uh, inch gap between the window glass and uh, the uh, window frames themselves that doesn't seem to matter and it doesn't seem to be significant in terms of the way that the building looks. All right, let's talk a little bit about cracked windows. So I've got another one of the uh, excess panes, uh, excess window frames uh, from this building. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways, of course, to model window cracking or, or missing panes. Uh, everybody's gonna have their own way. For me, um, probably one of the more advantageous things to do is if you're uh, remodeling or redoing these windows is to use uh, the thin you know, polystyrene as your window material rather than the thick stuff that uh, comes with the kit. One thing this allows for is uh, you know, just some ease of, say, carving out a, a, a particular area for uh, modeling a missing window pane. One option that you have for modeling things like cracks, for instance, is actually whether or not you've actually adhered the material to the window, is to basically just carve the cracks uh, into the backside of uh, the window pane. You know, the appearance on the front is basically of a crack. So it literally doesn't matter what side you actually draw the crack in, it's still gonna show up as exactly uh, what you think it, uh, it should be. And so I think that makes things you know, very, very simple uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that you're not just drawing a bunch of cracks and then seeing you know, the same crack uh, up in say this pane over here ending up over here. Because these are all individual window units, they're not gonna crack together. They're going to crack separately like this. So carving it into the back is a real easy way to be able to take advantage of seeing where the window uh, panes actually line up and then being able to draw in the crack that you want without trying to negotiate uh, these very, very thick window panes, uh, as you could see. Uh, so that's just my idea for doing it. Uh, and again, I think the result you get is, is pretty nice. It shows exactly what you would expect, cracked windows. If you want for these individual patches to, in some cases, be opaque, then at that point, it's a slightly different process because then you want to take uh, something more like a dark gray and make sure that you give a complete uh, undercoat uh, to these little styrene strips. That will allow you uh, to be able to, you know, color it with the top color and not have light pass through. But, you know, those can be an occasional bit that you add. Again, it's everything and anything that goes into these uh, window panes. So you're certainly welcome to use your favorite color palette or to use uh, your, your favorite approach of, of making these windows work. For me, this is uh, exactly what I needed in order to get uh, a nice, you know, neat and consistent look uh, for the Cassidy Tires building. The other thing to notice here is, you know, here's an example uh, right here of aluminum foil. Uh, glued into place. Again, all of this stuff is always put in using canopy glue. 
uh, I never use CA for any of these. And it's simply because, you know, I'm taking a tiny little piece and I'm maneuvering it into place on a fairly exacting set of window frames, especially if I'm trying to move pieces between uh, each other. So it's important in, in situations like that, uh, just to make sure that you've got a glue that's a little bit more forgiving than CA, which will bond and adhere, you know, quicker than you want it to, and is very difficult to get uh, to unadhere. So uh, foil here, basically because this is an insulated area, there's probably ductwork that may come from there. It's also next to this paneling for uh, the AC unit uh, as well. But we'll cover some of that stuff in a, a different video. So for the moment, this gives you an insight as to how I've uh, achieved this particular look on my models uh, using uh, uh, strip polystyrene, uh, canopy glue, and uh, paints for different colors. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, we'll get to part three, and in part three we'll cover uh, bricking over windows with uh, cinder block uh, and with brick using uh, some of the uh, wooden laser cut sheets that are available. See ya.